Hello, welcome back, I'm Kayla. This is my Big Easy Home where I share all of the best things about New Orleans, the people, the places, uh, the events, all of the things that make New Orleans an amazing place to live and visit. And I am in the Irish Channel today with my very good friend, Shay Trahan. Shay, thank you so much for taking some time to talk to me. Um, Shay's an architect. He is a music lover, an orchid enthusiast, uh, and he is also working on his PhD uh, in a field of architecture that is so new, he's basically pioneering it um, as he goes. And I think it has the potential to revolutionize the way we think about building design, space, how space affects us, and the potential that space contains. And I'm really excited for you guys to learn about this. So. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. It. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Awesome. Um, okay, so first, okay, so also, I'm pretty sure that Shay and I are distant relatives. He's probably a cousin of some degree, right? Like if you went far back, just based on your last name and yeah. where you're from, right? Yeah. So you're a child of the Cajun Nation. I am. As am I. Um, and I was driving here today and I was listening to OZ. And it was the Louisiana Music Show, and they were played Wayne Toops and Rosie Lede and Fernand Arsenault. And I'm going to see Lost by You Ramblers tonight. I'll see you there. Yay! Awesome! <laughs> and I'm here with you. So I feel like it's a very well themed day. It is. Today is a good day to be Cajun. It is a good day to be Cajun. Every day is a good day. It to be Cajun. is. I feel like I'm plucking the right note in the universe. Yeah. Basically, what That's that makes awesome me that feel you're like. Going to tips tonight. I'm so excited. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I did a video way back where I went to tips on the first night that they opened after the pandemic. It was a beautiful show, and Shay is the reason that I was able to be there. So. Yeah. That was that was thanks to my old neighbors who have now moved, but Stanton and Lauren, uh, Stanton being the drummer of Galactic and part owner of Tipitina's, and so amazing, amazing musician. Um, yeah, thanks to them. So yeah, that was a beautiful night. Um, that was fun. Very grateful that I was able to do that. So thanks again. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's get into this. You are an architect. How long have you been an architect? Um, I hate when I think about this because it's always more years than I thought. <laughs> um, 13, I've been practicing 13 years outside of college and I went to college for much, much too long. Right. <laughs> um, I did my undergrad at UL Lafayette. Uh, I did my master's at Tulane here and that's what brought me to New Orleans. Um, I've since gotten a certificate in the field of neuroscience for architecture okay. at the New School of Architecture and Design in San Diego. And I am currently a uh, Doctor of Design candidate at LSU with, uh, or in partnership with Stanford University. Okay. And we are investigating the ways that um, space affects us neurologically. Um, specifically, I am interested in architectural acoustics okay. um, and the way that the sonic environment that we live in, as the ice cream truck passes by. <laughs> Very well done. See? The day or the right note. We're plucking the right note. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very interested in the effects the sonic environment has on uh, us physiologically, neurologically, emotionally. Um, yeah, that's, that's the elevator pitch. Awesome. Yeah. So I, I met you, you were one of the first people that I met when I moved here. Shay was working on a TED talk that was a part of a TED talk that was happening in Lafayette. Was it all architecture? No, nope. no, nope, that was the only architect. Okay. Um, a, a friend of mine in Lafayette who is also an architect was in town and he had to meet up with Shay to kind of talk about that project and... He was my speech coach. He was his speech coach. So we met up at Fairgrounds, Fairgrounds, the coffee shop, and um, you basically went through the outline yeah, of your I, TED talk. I did a dry run. Did a dry run. And I was like, I was like, who is this guy? I was like, who is this guy? It was so brilliant to me. And because you, you talked about in that talk and then just mentioning that you're interested in like the sonic environment, Mm -hmm. you either 
were explicitly said or alluded to the idea that the the universe is sound. Yes. That the universe is composed of sound. Sound is the basic element of the universe. I believe that to be true. I believe that to be true also. It's a it's a, um, a common I'll say idea, theory, it's a huge part of the um, Eastern philosophies that I've you know dipped my toe in over the last 12 years and the esoteric philosophies that I've dipped my toe in and it's a I believe it fundamentally to be true. It's a huge part of like my spiritual understanding of yes. the cosmic space that I am a part of. And so to hear someone else who doesn't come from those spaces mm -hmm. give voice to that. I was just like, I crushed. I had a crush on you. I was like, this guy is, who is this guy? He's so brilliant. I love it. Um, wow. So what, okay, I have, I have so many questions. Um, first of all, what, what, what would you say are like the practical applications of what, of your work? So, uh, you know, every, every building we work on, we consider acoustics in one way or another. Um, if you don't consider it in the design phase, your client is going to complain about it in the occupation of the building. Um, and so it's one of those things that uh, you either do it on the front end or it'll catch you on the back end. Um, the, you know, there are spaces that are more sonically sensitive, uh, educational spaces being one of them, uh, healing spaces, hospitals, and actually one of the first... Uh, one of the pivotal studies that began the field of neuroscience for architecture was a study from a hospital. Um, and it was, it was an L-shaped hospital that did lots of gallbladder surgeries. Okay. And they, the insurance company recognized that people in one wing of this hospital tended to uh, recover one day sooner than the other wing. And required and requested less pain medication. Wow. And so they wanted the insurance company obviously wanted right. to know why. Right. They wanted right. everyone to heal quicker, right? And here um, I thought insurance companies were a scam and they had no <laughs> purpose whatsoever. But look what they provided. What with. they found out was <laughs> that that wing of the hospital had a view onto nature and oh. the other wing had a view onto a parking lot. Yes. Um, so the environment impacts it imprints itself onto us whether we're paying attention to it or not yeah. um, and so theaters museums concert halls uh, these these spaces we hire people specifically just to focus on the acoustics of the space and so as an architect I'd like to uh, I'd like to you know reclaim some of that uh, some of that work for you know we can do that on the front end in the design phase as the architect um, but not only that but I want to start to mess with it then you know I want to I want to I want to push it to its furthest extents and see what happens and so I want to create spaces that are intentionally uh, sonically enveloping in such a way as to induce uh, states of transcendence, to be quite honest. Yeah. Um, I, I hate to speak so lofty of it, but that's, that is the goal. Yeah. Um, no, I 100% want you to design a meditation room. Yes. Me at some point. And, uh, and by the way, the TED talk is entitled The Architecture of Sound, and it was TEDx Vermilion Street in Lafayette, and they did a brilliant job that year, and I owe them so much thanks. Um, is that still on YouTube? Yes. Okay, absolutely. I'm going to find it and I'll link it Facebook and not on Instagram. If you're watching it on Instagram, go to YouTube and then you'll be able to get on the link cuz I'm going to link of sound. I'm going to link to that talk if you guys are interested in following up with that. Yes. And and in that talk, uh, I put forth the idea of creating a sonic meditation chamber. Um, but I designed the chamber through mapping the shape of sound. Sound has a shape uh, yeah, if the universe is made of sound, if that's the fundamental element, the matter is yeah. a result of the shape of sound. Yes, yeah. actually, uh, the, if, if you really want to know how sound formed the universe in its earliest stage, 
Googled the term baryon acoustic oscillations. Okay, that's a mouthful. You're going to have to spell that for me at as, some point. <laughs> as the plasma cloud after the Big Bang cooled, baryon particles started to form. And when they formed, they created this, this low okay. tone that rippled through the plasma cloud. And in the, in the crests of the waves, uh, the, the plasma rarefied, it pushed apart. Okay. And in the troughs of the waves, it came together. Okay. And Ooh, that pulsation. that pattern is now found in how the cosmos came to be. Wow. And so we are from beginning to end a sound wave in made manifest. It's so fascinating that we're able to discover these things to me. I'm yeah. like, you know, we can be so, I don't know banal as humanity and um it makes road rage seem so unimportant it's, yes <laughs> it does and it makes a lot of the things that we tend to put our focus on and worry about and and create anxiety for ourselves for just seem like why yeah you know why yeah um what originally drew you to architecture as a as a career created that passion for you uh, someone asked me that the other day and I was like, I don't really have a good answer except that I've always known it. Um, when I was in middle school, um, I would save up my money and go to Hobby Lobby and buy graph paper, like the biggest sheets I could find. And I would design these houses. Um, and each house had this like kitsch theme about it that, um, that I would try and design. Like I designed one that had a waterfall that was in the bathroom and so it was your shower. Wow. Um, and so like, it, it was I just something that. I did in I my free time. You have to design time. that for me too. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so, you know, proceeding to high school and we have to do a career day thing and, uh, you know, I just chose architecture. And then, um, and then when I started architecture school, the very first thing that they do, especially at UL, the, the uh, School of Architecture is in the College of the Arts, and um, they take the position that uh, the Western education system has not prepared you well to uh, think critically and um, and creatively for new solutions, and so they begin by trying to unwire you and then rewire you. Wow. You know, um, actually, uh, the professor Hector Lasala is is he's impacted a whole generation of architects coming out of Lafayette um but when I got into that I was like oh there's more going on here than just designing kitsch houses yeah. and this is where I want to be you know this is what I want to do um and so now <laughs> now I do basically no kitsch houses right. you know but um but I love I love my career and I love pushing, pushing the boundary of, of what can be considered architecture. You know, space is important and we forget that. It's easy to overlook it, but uh, especially, you know, on the, what I hope is the backside of a pandemic, um, think about where you quarantined and think about the impact that the physical environment had on your mental health. Yeah. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to have moved into this home, um, which is, has generous space for my son and I, um, two months before the pandemic. Wow. Um, and if, when I think back, if we had been quarantined in my old house, I would have been in really bad shape. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not where I would have wanted to be locked down for an extended period. Um, and so it just reaffirmed for me, uh, you know, that our health and well-being is directly tied to, we are, we are creatures of our environment, um, literally. Yeah. And, and so uh, quarantine only further drove that home for me. Yeah. And it becomes a question of ethics when it comes to how you design a prison how you design uh, a hospital, how you design a school, um, how you design uh, low-income housing, you yeah. know? 
Uh, and we've seen in recent decades shifts in thought behind each of those different typologies on, um, you know, what, what, what is the ethical response uh, architecturally, so. You, um, you had a big, you played a big role in the team that's responsible for the restoration of the building that became the Sazerac House. Yes. Which is, if you don't know what the Sazerac House is, it's a museum on Canal Street, Canal and Magazine? Canal and Magazine. Canal yeah. and Magazine. Um, it is a cocktail museum. It's a museum dedicated to cocktail culture and history in New Orleans. The Sazerac um, cocktail being the official cocktail of the city. Mm -hmm. It is um, one of the most beautifully curated museums, I think. But the space is gorgeous. If you have y'all haven't been to the Sazerac House, you need to. Um, yes. If you're watching this and you don't live here and you're coming to visit, I highly recommend that you make the Sazerac House a part of your itinerary and you go in there and you check it out. You For can do free. tastings. They have all kinds of fun classes that you can take. They do pairings with like, you know, whiskey and meat, or they'll do chocolate and and bourbon or whatever. There's a lot yeah. of really creative things that they do ways that they engage you and it's just a great it's a great time so talk a little bit about that project sure that was uh i'm honored to have been able to be a steward of that building um the buildings date back to 1860s um and they were originally three buildings um when we got them they were two separate buildings that had been kind of um awkwardly linked together and uh and so now they function as a single facility um but like you said it is a uh a museum to the american cocktail um there is an event space uh an entire floor that you can rent for a, a wedding or a conference no, or anything awesome. okay. uh and then it is also the corporate headquarters for the sazerac company which is America's largest liquor holder. Um, and it's a distillery. Yes, it is an active distillery inside of a museum. Um, and so it created a whole world of complications because uh, museums and distilleries don't normally go together. Well, that's what I was thinking. Yes. There's so many different spaces with so many different functions, yeah. putting them into one unified experience. And and I, I hate to be so blunt, but distilleries are explosive. You right. know, in museums typically you you can pack a lot of people into them and so you know, the state fire marshal the first time we approached him about this was like, How are y'all going to do this, you yeah. know, safely? Um and so we, we had to get very innovative in a whole lot of ways. And I did that project uh, with my previous firm, Trapple and Pier Architects. Um, and they actually just won a state award from the American Institute of Architects, um, a design merit award for the project. Um, and I'm currently now with MADE Architects. I uh, mm -hmm. just want to mention that Merlin mm -hmm. Architecture and Design and we are doing some innovative, cool uh, stuff that will be coming out in the next couple of years. Um, but back to Sazerac House, um, it's, it's rare that we get to story tell so frankly through architecture as we did at the Sazerac House. Um, and it was, it was challenging because we wanted to honor the historic uh, without creating any false sense of history, you know? Um, and so, you know, the, the clients wanted uh, a French Quarter feel right across the Canal Street from the French Quarter, you know, we want to capture that feel. Um, we didn't put wrought iron into the building. Instead, we used plasma cut steel that borrowed uh, floral patterns from the Pantabla building in the French Quarter um, and made what feels very much like a French Quarter courtyard um, with, with what feels like wrought iron ironwork um, but is unapologetically the 21st century construction and, mm. and if, if you stop and, and, and 
touch the the elements and and stop to look and see and smell um you you get this blend of history and contemporary life um and and i think that's what's led to the the numerous awards that the project has been granted um for me it was also a really exciting project because it's one of the only projects where we got to touch all the senses you know um, every project touches most of our senses, and, and I consider us to have more than five senses. Mm -hmm. um, but this was, this was the first one where we can actually say, you're going to taste oak wood, you know? And mm -hmm. you're going to do that while standing on a floor made of oak wood. Um, you know, you're going to smell the ingredients that go into Peychaud's bitters. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so we were very intentional in how we guided the design of the exhibitry, um, how the museum was curated, um, how, how a patron experiences the distillery, um, because we wanted, we wanted you to feel steam, we wanted you to smell um, bitters, we wanted you to feel charred wood, you know? Um, and so we really got to, I got to geek out um, beyond measure on that project mm -hmm. and it I spent four years on it it was my baby from beginning to end and I'm I, I'm super proud of the work we did and the the resulting project and I have to give it to the Sazerac company they gave they put a lot of trust in us and uh, since handing the building over to them they have done amazing things with it and they continue to program and curate um, impeccably, and I, I think it's a world-class museum on par with the World War II Museum. I think it's fantastic, and I, I very much picked up on that historic meets contemporary vibe, um, and for me, that's so much of what makes New Orleans an interesting place. I mean, mm -hmm. if you go to the West Bank and you stand on the levee and you look at the skyline of New Orleans, which is the only way to see the skyline of New Orleans, as far as I'm concerned, you see this very clear demarcation between like the high rises of the central business district and the old world of the French Quarter. Yeah. And it is a clear visual representation of, for me, what I feel is New Orleans. We are both old and new, and you can see that driving in any neighborhood <laughs> a brand new structure will sit very close or next door to something that is literally falling apart. Yeah. And somehow those two things resonate and coexist harmoniously together. And I think it's one of the things that makes New Orleans such a creative space to be in and it's such an inspiring space to be in. And I feel like that was really captured in, in the museum. Just so. thank you. Uh, and just the other day, David Merlin and myself, uh, my my boss had made um we're driving around having that exact conversation that um there is a whole lot of creativity that's taking place in the city oh my gosh. um and it may not it may not get mentioned on par with new york or la um but this is a fascinating laboratory we're working in and when the old and the new come together in complementary ways the the sum is greater than uh or the the result is greater than the sum of the parts you know yeah. um and and i really love doing those kinds of projects they get to exploit that you know yeah. to the benefit of all the users yeah yeah this project this my big easy home project i mean it's, it's an, a lot of things to me but one of the things that it is on on a more spiritual level is really getting at what makes New Orleans what it is. Mm -hmm. And the people are a big part of that. And in particular, the creativity and what people here choose to do with that creative energy is a hallmark of what makes New Orleans a place that people want to live, people can't leave, people have to come back to, you know, people visit. And I hope that when this body of work is done, that that is it's something that people that. get out of that. Yeah, totally. for sure, for sure. Um, you're a music lover, you love music, your, your whole um, uh, PhD work is about sonics, 
and space. So what yeah. what is it about music that has captured your heart? Uh, well, I don't trust anyone that music doesn't capture their heart, right? <laughs> That's like people who don't like dogs. Right. Know, it's, just, uh... it's like people who don't like to eat. I'm like, what? <laughs> okay. Um, no, music is, uh, music is something, you hear music before you're even born. Literally, yeah. you yeah. know? Um, and it's, it's something that you can partake in, uh, it's it's sacramental. It's communal. Um, it it speaks to our culture as Cajuns. Absolutely. Um, it speaks to the culture of New Orleans. Um, and and few things move me more than uh, more than music does. I've uh, in the doctorate program. I've spent quite a bit of time studying aesthetics. Um, there's a whole field called neuroaesthetics, which is specifically focused on, um, you know, the effect of art and on your brain and body, right? Um, there's, a, there's a fascinating laboratory at Johns Hopkins University called the International Arts and Mind Lab, and their sole purpose is to study the way that art, music, and architecture impact the brain and body. Yeah. Um, and we take that for granted. Yeah. Like we don't we don't realize like you were talking about when you're talking about Sazerac, you're talking about the tasting the oak in mm -hmm. what you're drinking and standing on the oak floor, right? And we don't very rarely I mean I'm sure there are some people who are sensitive enough to perceive on some cognitive level that resonance, but I don't think that we fully appreciate that those things do affect us on a cellular level. Yeah. You know, um, and music is transportive. It takes you to, it can completely change your emotional state. Mm -hmm. It can completely shift your mental state. It can take you to a completely different place and time. Yes. You know, and um, it's really, really powerful. I chant a lot um, as a part of my meditation and I was just in my practice this morning for the first, and I've been doing this for a long time, and for the first time I was like, don't, don't make the sound, step into the sound. Mm -hmm. Like the sound is already there. All you have to do is step into it and let it, let it make itself through you. Yes. Right? Yeah. And I'm not a musician, I have no musical skills whatsoever. Um, I can dance, and so I feel like my body is kind of an instrument in that regard. But I think about musicians, and when I watch musicians do what they do, who are smooth, I'm like, they are in a flow Absolutely. that is that that they're not controlling, they're not thinking, they're not trying to figure out what they're gonna do next. They've completely surrendered to right. this stream of sound that they have stepped themselves into. It's coming through them. Yeah, you know, they are a vessel into which it pours and out of which it comes. Right. Um, and, and my fascination is to think of uh, how architecture can act as an instrument of the human body, right? Yeah. We, we already treat it as such, you know, we're, we're sitting in chairs right now, yeah. you know. The, Very like, nice chairs, by the way, she's got some great furniture. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm fascinated with the idea that um, the spaces we create and inhabit um, could be an actual instrument, you know, that it's, um, you know, I, I think back, most everyone can recall a time that they were in a very reverberant space, you know, yeah. that they were in a cave or they were in a, a, a large church and that was empty, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, we see, uh, uh, there's this viral video on, on YouTube of, a woman who's alone inside of a chapel singing Ave Maria. Um, and like, I, I got goosebumps thinking about it. Uh, and the space is partaking in her act of music. You know, um, she is, she is interacting with the architecture through sound. And, um, I think that in a 21st century world, 
that is uh, slightly more secular than the world our grandparents came up in, um, that to, to lose the sacrament of sound uh, is to throw the baby out with the bathwater, mm. right? And so um, I aim to make sacramental spaces, and, and in fact, it's, uh, it's still confidential, but uh, a, a team that I am working with has... Uh, but don't give away too much now, because this is going to be published on the YouTube. I know, I know. Uh, <laughs> we have a site... And we have our first six-figure donation of uh, funding to build the first sonic temple uh, oh. based on my work. I love it. And um, yeah, we can't. I I cannot wait to inhabit that space. I'm super excited for that too. I never really consider. I mean, for all that I'm aware of, like you know, talking about walking into spaces and feeling them and going, like, "This feels good. This is a disturbing feeling. This is whatever." I never really, really thought about like buildings or space as living things right. until right now. Yeah. Just listening to you talk, I'm like, oh, no wonder they're so effective. They're alive. Yeah. And I think that that's true. And I'm just kind of getting that. Yeah. Right now. It's, you know, the, um, and if you think about it as an instrument, um, it begs the question, an instrument of what, right? Mm -hmm. um, and for, it's an instrument of cognition. It's, you know, our senses don't stop at the skin, right. you know? Um, mm -hmm. all, all you need is someone looming over your shoulder to understand that your body schema extends beyond the boundary of your physical form. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the senses are the vehicles through which we experience that. And basically I am arguing in my doctorate on behalf of a metaphysics that considers sound as primal in, in creation, experience, um, and sacrament, you know? Yeah. And I'm, I'm a huge fan of silence. I love silence. But what I also know is that there is no such like there's no such thing as silence in the spaces I inhabit. Right. There's a we we had talked about I forget where that place the is. Anechoic chamber. Yes. Explain this room to these people. So, so <laughs> anechoic chambers are typically found. Uh, you'll you'll typically only find them in uh, like physics departments at universities. Um, but it is a soundproof room, basically. It is. A room which is designed to not only block out external sounds, but to uh, to capture and absorb all internal sound as well. And so we're in part of my living room right now, mm -hmm. and there is there is a reverberation. You can mm -hmm. hear my voice for a split second after I finish making the tone. Right um, in an anechoic chamber the building itself absorbs all of that sound. And so you're left with no reverberation. And uh, it's, you know, occupying that space has been uh, described as, as being uh, inducing hallucinations, um, that you start to hear low body sounds, uh, such as the blood flowing through your veins or your nervous system at work. Um, I want to experience this so bad. You have no idea. It's in some of those things you can experience without an anechoic chamber, yeah. um, and and I would recommend everyone, anyone who has a meditation practice, ought to have a uh, a deep listening practice as mm. well, um, and and really dive into that, you yeah. know, and 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 listen to your body physically, actually listen sonically you know um of course listen to your body like listen to your gut you know, right, or right, right something doesn't feel right you know um but I'm, I'm talking in literal terms as well you know yeah 
how long has someone lasted in a room like that? What's the longest? I think? Uh, they, s I, I don't know. Oh, okay. But, but supposedly after 20 or 30 minutes, most people are hallucinating. Wow. I don't, I. Like who needs drugs <laughs> when we have these kinds of things? In and our it's worlds. and it's a it's that's that's what happens when you deprive the brain of one of the one of its key senses, right? You know, right. and it's actually it's it's a sense that you've been using since before you were born. Mm -hmm. um, it never turns off. There's no such thing as an ear lid, right? right? When we go to sleep, we don't see anything, you don't smell anything, uh, but you still hear, you're still listening. You know, how often does the sound of your alarm? just weave itself right into your yeah. dream. It happened this very morning. And yeah. This is the calmest I've been all day because right. I've been behind <laughs> the eight ball all day. Um, but yeah, so sound is important. If if I haven't, you know, driven that yeah. home quite enough, um, there's my thesis. Yeah. Orchids, I want to talk just briefly about the orchids because um, orchids are beautiful. Yes. Um, but you really, during the pandemic, is when the, is that, um, is that right? When yeah. this hobby of yours really took off? Yeah, when, uh, when quarantine started, I had a half empty house and one dying orchid. And I had successfully killed two or three orchids prior to that, um, but had nothing of a green thumb, couldn't, didn't have any house plants or whatever. Mm -hmm. And this one orchid I put, I, you know, I googled what kind of light it needs and how to water it and mm -hmm. did all of that and it was just dropping its flowers. It was dying. Um, and so I gave up and I put it in that front window facing 3rd Street, baking in the sun. Uh, I stopped watering it the way Google said and I just started, I'd give little bits of my water bottle to it periodically. Yeah. And it thrived. It, it not only stopped dropping blooms, but it's, it put out a new shoot and started making more blooms. It's still alive today. Um, and thus began a fascination I have with, uh, yeah, the, the, with orchids of all species. And so now my home has just over a hundred orchids in it. Um, I hide them well. It's, it's, we're yeah, not- Yeah, I was kind of expecting to see more. More lushness, yeah. yeah. Uh, some of them live outside, mm -hmm. uh, which is an, something I didn't know going into quarantine, that Louisiana, you could grow orchids outside. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, but... Um, I mean, obviously orchids grow outside because they're nature, but um, right. in our environment, which seems so If brutal. you have just the right orientation of your house, um, it, particularly... Uh, a yard that is on the north side of your home. Mm -hmm. um, Ooh, my yard's on the north side of my home. Okay. okay, well the next orchid you have, just go ahead and put it out on that north okay. side. Okay. And uh, it should thrive. Um, and so I've, I've, I've grown way past just your grocery store Phalaenopsis uh, orchids. I, of the hundred something orchids I have, I think I have about 20 to 25 different species. Um, these are actually all orchids around us okay. um, that are epiphytic and so they just grow on the side of trees mm -hmm. and, uh, and are largely fed by moisture in the air. Um, and my passion really, I, I love fragrant orchids mm -hmm. and, and weird orchids to be blunt, you know, yeah. the weirder the better. Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple of black orchids um yeah yeah it's it's something that surprised me that i'm good at now yeah um but that yeah. that the two things that got me through quarantine were meditation and caring for my orchids which i i shouldn't really speak of that as two separate, separate things, things you know yeah. um yeah is there a connection between your professional work and your orchid work? I don't know. I, you know, I, I've had, I've had a peer ask me what in, you know, if I went in, if I took a deep dive like I did in the TEDx talk, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and I thought about architecture in terms of orchids, what would come out the other end? Mm -hmm. And it's, 
no pun intended, it's, it planted a seed in my brain that uh, hasn't quite uh, germinated yet, mm -hmm. but it's, it's something I'm thinking about and pondering about. And uh, give me a couple of years and I might have a compelling okay. answer to you. Okay. Shockingly, I have yet to go to the botanical gardens here in New Orleans. Oh, well, we should go. It's right behind us. They have a whole orchid room from what I've heard. It's a beautiful space, yeah. Well, it. it's... Uh, Louisiana residents get in free on Wednesdays. Well, there we go. We'll have to go on a Wednesday. Let's do it. One last question. You live in the Irish Channel. I do. Neighborhood. Um, tell everybody what you love about the channel. Okay. I, I, am, I am a super proud channelite. <laughs> um, I've been in the channel for five years now. Um, and I've lived all over the city except for maybe... Bayou St. John in Mid City. Okay. Uh, so I, I know they're great. It's a great neighborhood. I know. I think you would dig it. I, I know. Do. I can't. It's I, quieter. It's quiet, but I think you would like it. I can't pass judgment on that neighborhood, but <laughs> I, I lived on Frenchman for years. I've lived uh, off of State Street and deep in Uptown. Lived off of Carrollton, and nothing holds a flame to the channel mm -hmm. for me. Um, the neighborhood is fantastic. The uh, you know, the architectural, uh, style. Like, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the built environment here mm -hmm. is, uh, just dense enough and just the right scale for me. Um, the, the porch culture is strong. Uh, that's another thing that got me through quarantine. Was... Explain porch culture for people who may not be from here who don't oh know my what goodness. that is. So, okay, so just outside my door, <laughs> yeah, just outside my front door is the extension of my living room. Um, and I often, uh, except for during the months where it's too hot to do so, uh, my front door often stays open. My record collection is, is played out loud and shared with the neighborhood. Um, but I live just about three doors down from Parasol's bar and restaurant, uh, one of the better po'boys in town. Um, Tracy's is down the street as well. And then I would be remiss if I didn't mention the channel's best dive bar, which is Pete's Out in the Cold. Okay. It's cash only, there's a bar cat. It's got everything. I'm a bar cat. Need. Yes. Um, <laughs> during quarantine, though, the house across the street from Parasols, uh, basically once a week, they would host a porch concert. Were they, they the first hire... ones to do the porch concert? I don't know. Um, but they would hire out-of-work bands from here in New Orleans, which there are a plenty. Um, and they would, they would play a concert on their porch and everyone would hang out on their own porches or in the street, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, the, uh, my neighbor next door actually hosted a porch concert with a brass band, uh, for her baby's one year birthday, Aww. right? So this child is not going to You don't get more this. New Orleans than that. No, no, <laughs> but, uh, when the trumpet player started dancing, to feet don't fail me now. Um, that's officially the best first birthday party I've ever <laughs> been to. Sure. You know? um, yeah, and so the channel has great food. Uh, we're right in the middle of everything. We're we're on Magazine Street. Uh, the vintage is my jam. Love that place. Yes. Uh, stuffed beignets is what's up. Um, yeah, it's just I I. I think I live in the finest neighborhood the city has to offer. Um, I remember actually listening to, um, I believe it was Now Hear This on NPR, uh, at the beginning of quarantine, and they were talking about uh, passive houses and ventilation in houses. And the expert architect actually mentioned, he was like, you know who's probably doing the best? out of all of us is all the people living in the historic neighborhoods in New Orleans because those those buildings were built to ventilate. Yes. And I was like, oh my God, yes, <laughs> you're right. And I'm sitting on my porch listening to you, you know, and um, it's, it builds culture. I know, I know people in the neighborhood because 
of sitting on the porch. Um, I feel comfortable leaving my house. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't leave my doors unlocked, but uh, whenever I leave town, I don't worry about the safety of my home because, uh, quite frankly, because the bar down the street is my neighborhood watch program. You know, <laughs> like half the people there know who I am, and if yeah. something were awry, they would let me know. Right. You know? Right. I think um, we have so many great neighborhoods here. A neighborhood choice is such a deeply personal experience for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and I am thrilled for you that you have found your magic place. I feel like I feel that way about Bayou St. John. I know you do. Um, yeah. And so I'm happy that you, you're you having that experience. Thank you. I am too. <laughs> um, I'm honored to, to have it and I love it. Yeah, great. So um, I usually ask my last question is, if people want to contact you, how do they find you on the internet and how they find you on social media? Um, but I realize, you know, you may not want to give out your personal social media tags. No, um, that's fine. But um, if there is a place where people can go on the internet um, to find you or what you're working on or a, a way to get in touch with you if they wanted to contact you about something, sure. Um, where would they go? Well, uh, I'm on Facebook and. I don't really use Instagram, so don't try and reach me there because okay. I feel like an old man using Instagram. <laughs> I'm like, how do I? That's why I about TikTok. TikTok. I'm like, whatever. I'm like, <laughs> oh. too, um, old, too old to learn that. But uh, I have a website, shaytrahan.com, and it's s h e a t r a h a n dot com. Um, and there's actually an email portal there where people can uh, reach me. Um, yeah, or reach out on Facebook and watch the TEDx talk, The Architecture of Sound. Uh, if you don't like it, I'll give you your money back. Right. Um, <laughs> and but, I'll tag all those things so that you guys can get to them pretty easy. But I think it's cool, so I, think I hope it's you cool think too. it's cool too. You know? I, it was great to, to sit down with you and hear that, like, the rough sort draft. of the rough draft and then see the final the final project you did a great job it was fun thank you You're thank welcome. you i'm very proud of it uh i have severe performance anxiety believe Doesn't it or show. not Doesn't um, show so to do to do that talk was a, a small miracle for me mm -hmm. um and it's something i'm very proud of you should be thank you you're welcome Shay, thank you so much. My pleasure. Truly. I appreciate you so much as a as a human being, somebody that I can talk to about all the weird spiritual things that go on in my head. <laughs> well, tonight at Tipitina's, we will be we will be going in, to church in tonight. communion <laughs> with the Lost Bayou Ramblers. Super excited! Great. Right, well, I'll see you tonight. I'm yes. super excited. Awesome. Yep. All right, guys, uh, reach out to Shay if you're interested in his work. Um, I will link to the TED Talk. Be sure to check that out. And if you have any questions about the Irish Channel, you can ask him or me. Yeah. And if you have any questions about real estate in general in the city of New Orleans, I'm your gal. Uh, hit me up and you can email me at thatrealtorlady504 at gmail.com or you can reach out wherever you're watching this video. Thanks and have a great weekend. Bye.